it's a very great pleasure, Mike, to have you here. Um, I've known Mike for actually a lot longer than I've known Jeremy, but we won't say just how long, uh, but it's a very long time. Uh, Mike has, there's a little mini bio uh, about Mike in the program, but I would just like to add to that a little bit by saying that really um, not only is Mike a um, researcher and a clinician, but he is regarded internationally as one of the leading people who knows about uh, obesity and uh, diabetes from a nutritional aspect particularly. He's made an enormous contribution, uh, which has been recognized by him recently being awarded the Rank Prize in Nutrition, which is one of the most prestigious prizes of its kind uh, in the United Kingdom and very much acknowledged internationally. Uh, Mike's always had a good reputation. Um, so well, at least... Uh, yeah, I think please please stop now, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> but I did just want to say that really Mike's recent work, which he's going to be talking about today, relating to remission of diabetes, is probably one of the most exciting developments in the field of diabetes recently. And Mike, it's really a privilege to have you here to talk about your work. Um, it's now taken off. Everybody worldwide talks about the direct study, and to hear it straight from you is, is very good indeed. So thank you for being here and talking on that. Thank, thank you very much, Jim. The, we won't count the years, but I was going to reflect on why I'm here at all. And actually, I have known Jim for a very long time. Oops. Failing your... <laughs> yeah, a very long time. And Jim was very much, and still is, my mentor. And it goes back to his invitation to join the... Um, EASD Diabetes Nutrition Group meeting in 1980, something a very long time ago. But the reason I'm here today is, is it actually tells a story. And there are two reasons. One, 2003, my son left school and dashed off around the world with his bagpipes and his fiddle. And he sent me a message saying, text, I'm on the top of Mount Roy, call it's near Bwanaka. I haven't had to pay for food, drink, accommodation, or anything else for six weeks. When are you coming? And he said, in the same text, there's a mountain I can see called Mount Aspiring. We better go and climb it. So I packed a bag, literally packed a bag, put in my rope, my ice axe, and off we went, and we climbed Mount Aspiring. And on the way down, looking for somewhere to camp, there was there were two tents on the side of the hill, and a young couple and a slightly older, older sort of chap were there, and they shouted, hey, do you want a cup of tea? And we thought, yes. And we faffed around with their fire, which wouldn't light, and then they said, have a glass of wine instead. And we thought, they must be in New Zealand. And we chatted, and the light was going down, and where are we going to put our tent? And um, we were just about to say goodbye when the young woman said, do you happen to know somebody called Jim Mann by any chance? <laughs> and this young woman had been roughly intelligent, and she'd been listening to the conversation, and it was none other than Juliet, who I last saw when she was about three years old. And there she was with her husband up on the side of Mount Aspiring. And that, she said, come down to the Eden quick, Jim needs your help. And I won't go into the story any further, but I did. And that was one of the reasons. And the other reason is that I fell in with a bunch of musicians from Dunedin who were called the Chaps, and some of you know them very well. And they have become very great family friends. So here we are again. Um, slide, I'm still daring to show this slide because it is almost exactly 100 years since the discovery of insulin. And we've heard how quickly it was thought to be the answer to everything, and quite quickly it was realized, oh no, it isn't the answer to everything, especially not for people with type 2 diabetes, as it turned out. That painting is by Frederick Bant. Banting was an absolutely rotten doctor. Um, he knew how to apply a plaster to an open wound, and that's it. He was a completely useless scientist, but happened to fall in under the spell of uh, MacLeod, who had just discovered insulin. That's a version of the story. But he was a very, very good painter in oils. So if you've got one of his paintings tucked away, Either give it to me or look after it. There you go. Um, and that's home and my disclosures, which are not very many. Um, and that's just to let you know that there is sunshine in Scotland. And actually, it was quite nice when I left. Now, the story which unfolds is a familiar one. And you've all seen these pictures, fabulous uh, pictures from CDC, how the, the bluer they go, the higher the prevalence of obesity measured as a hemoglobin of uh, BMI over 30. And the redder they go, the higher prevalence of diabetes, 2004, 2014. And my goodness, don't they go together? Is this not the same disease? And that perhaps is a, a, a really strong message 
from, from me. And we already knew that, of course, from the nurse's health study. These relative risk figures, epidemiologists get really excited about a relative risk of two. If I say your risk of something horrible is double yours, you get worried, don't you? Double, two. Well, here we have relative risks of 10, 20, 100 fold as the BMI goes up. Already with a BMI of 25, which is not normal by anybody's imagination, you've got this relative risk of almost 10 of developing type 2 diabetes compared to the hero with a BMI of 21 or 22 on the summit of a mountain. Um, thank you. I expected applause at that point. No, okay. <laughs> um, this can only be a causal relationship. You do not need to prove that this is causal. You cannot get these relative risks without it being causal. And I just mentioned that get to a BMI of 25, I'd have to put on somewhere around about 15 kilograms, and that 15 number is important. Metabolic syndrome, we argued, is it a syndrome? Is it this, is it that? It, is, it has now found its place as a totally reversible and preventable collection of diseases which emerge from people's predisposition, which may be genetic or epigenetic, and even the guys in Cambridge haven't worked that one out, but clearly about 30 or 40% of the entire population, if they gain weight, will develop the beginnings and then ultimately these diseases that we know about. And I reflect here that it is weight gain, or specifically waste gain, which tells us something about where you're putting your fat as you gain weight. The WHO definition of obesity, and I think this is, if, if, if you'd like all to remember one thing and then go home, this is probably it, um, that overweight and obesity are or is defined as abnormal or excessive, not one or the other, I mean, not both, but, but one or the other accumulation that presents a risk for health. So becoming visibly overweight tells you you have this disease process, but becoming not visibly overweight, but putting your fat into abnormal places is the same disease process. It's just a matter of your genetics, where you put it and what happens at the end. So there you go. Single disease process. Uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes are the same disease process. It just affects some people differently. So you have to be in that susceptible group and we know which groups they are. And this is just a reflection. I have to say something nice about Oxford from time to time. Um, and this was one study which I think is important. We clever doctors have tended to shy away from even mentioning the word overweight or obesity to our patients. Patients who are enormously overweight and visibly so can attend GPs for years and nobody mentions it, nobody touches on it. This study used a very simple patter, a brief intervention, um, which simply the patients had all been weighed before they saw the doctor. The doctor was told to use these words. They did it to invite people to follow up a suggestion they might like to look on some evidence-based approaches to weight management. And the answer was out of 2,728, only four individuals felt that that approach was inappropriate. The rest thought it was a good idea to be given some uh, advice, even though they hadn't asked for it. So don't shy away from mentioning this thing. Now, Ben told us about type 1 diabetes and how we're getting on top of it. And this is a sort of stereotypic view of the history. We were all told about the honey disease, the honey urine, and we were told how you put your finger into the urine and you suck it and it's taste of sugar, doesn't it? All medical students did this, except the smart ones realized that two fingers were involved. And when, when I was being, when I was, if you're not smart, you make a terrible error and it's terribly funny and we all roar with laughter. When I was a medical student, and this applies to many of us, the people teaching me referred to severe diabetes and to mild diabetes. And mild diabetes was something that happened in old people, and you give them a pill and tell them to come back in a year's time and not to worry about it. And you can live a fine life with your type 2 diabetes, as we now call it. Progression, um, uh, I, I suppose it was Himsworth who, who reckoned that insulin sensitivity was, was the differential between those who did well with, with insulin and those who didn't. And then Andrew Cudworth gave it type 1, type 2 names, and we split squash together. These were the old days. We now are on top of type 1. We should be on top of type 1 diabetes. The technology, all the clever things we've heard about, make this totally manageable if the patients are able and willing. But type 2 has become this ghastly disease, which is now presenting far more complications, diabetes-specific and cardiovascular, than the type 1. So I would now say that is now the severe diabetes, and it's the one which is taxing whole communities. So there you go. Um, the biggest disease, the most, one of the most expensive diseases that any healthcare system has to deal with, with all this list of ghastly outcomes, which we were told was incurable, inevitably progressive, 
take a pill, come back in a year's time. And just to, um, Ben again showed a slide from the Swedish study which was looking at life expectancy. In this case, and this is from the same group, um, uh, some of that anyway, the 10 year survival with breast cancer, which many people think is a bad disease, you'd agree, is 80%. The 10-year survival with, uh, with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, about 60%. The 10-year survival with type 2 diabetes, 50%. And the further data which have come from the um, Risk Factor Initiative, if you develop your type 2 diabetes under the age of 40, a lot of people do, the loss of life is of the order of 15 years. This is a huge disease. This is much worse than many cancers. Take a pill and come back in a year's time. Would you accept chemotherapy for a cancer? You probably would if you thought there was a remission at the end of it. Would you accept a few weeks of limited food intake to get a remission for your cancer? You probably would, but diabetes, why, why are we not treating it in the same way? Message. So, what do we do about this disease? Can we prevent it? And we can run through the other questions we might get there if we're lucky. Prevention. Or a large number now of prevention trials have been done with people who have pre-diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance to see can it be prevented. And the answer is resoundingly yes, with a high certainty provided there is weight loss. And I think Jacob Tumilato has dissected whether physical activity or other aspects are important. But weight loss of quite a modest amount of the order of five, five to 10 kilograms can prevent most new diabetes in people identified with pre-diabetes. And that's hugely exciting if we are in a position to identify it, screening, and, and catch it. And longer-term studies, and this is the longest and the most doubtful of the data, say that the benefits will, will be then represented in reduction in cardiovascular events up to 30 years later. There's a commentary which Navid Sattar and I wrote on this. There are doubts about this, but the other studies have all shown long-term protection against diabetes up to 10 or 15 years. Now that prevention of diabetes formed part of the work which was done by the, the Diabetes Nutrition Study Group and which was published earlier this year. Um, and that was, again, Jim is probably to blame for this entire program of work which, is, which soldiered on for five years to produce new dietary guidelines, tackling a number of elements of, of diet which were considered to be vital uh, in the management of, of diabetes. And the list of them here with the, the individuals involved, Europe has expanded, as you probably are well aware, to include most of Canada and little bits of New Zealand. Um, and relatively late in the day, people twigged that all the rest of it is for the birds, unless you get weight control in place. Because they, they all have important um, effects and they're all valuable. They've all been tested with meta-analysis and heaven, a huge amount of work was done into developing these uh, guidelines. But weight management clearly is the key. And so we, we sort of took on that. Just to I'm not going to talk any more about those guidelines, except to say one of the interesting elements was um, that we developed a, an approach towards diet, which is not sort of food-based or nutrient-based, but looking at eating patterns and food patterns. And I think this is a valuable way to go forward. There are two types of eating patterns. There are um, traditional diets, of which the Mediterranean, vegetarian, Nordic, Japanese, there are lots of them. Um, and then there are therapeutic diets, and we have a number of those. And, and the, they all have benefits. They've all been tested to death with meta-analyses and such like. Um, they all have benefits. The difference probably is that the therapeutic diets identify an individual um, in a family or in a situation um, who has to behave differently from the rest of everybody else. And they're difficult to sustain. They really are quite hard to sustain. Whereas a traditional style of diet, if we can unwrap and wind back from all the lures of 21st century marketing, does prevent, present a lot of benefits and is acceptable to families and the whole of communities. So we'll go back to that. The weight management side of it, um, the, the recommendations not terribly exciting in some ways, but at least they're set down now uh, with their evidence base and their grading of the recommendations. Basically, anybody with type 2 diabetes who's overweight or obese, and remember that means excessive amount or um, t uh, place of fat, type of fat, should be supported with evidence-based treatments to maintain weight loss. A variety of methods can be used. There's nothing much to choose between them. Um, we can use the formula diets, which were, which were pilloried by our profession for generations because of one or two potentially um, erroneous attributions of, of death with people on 
a formula diets in the 1960s in North America when they were doing modified fasts and they didn't have any concept of nutritionally balanced diets. Modern formula diets are perfectly acceptable if people are willing to do it to induce the weight loss or to use for meal replacements. And that is acceptable to many people who find it difficult to choose meals which are acceptable. Importantly, the recommendation that neither the very high carbohydrate diets, extreme high carb, or very low ketogenic diets are recommended, partly because they're very difficult to sustain, but, but there is, from epidemiologists outside diabetes work, increased mortality at the extreme ends of these diet profiles. The other thing this guideline did was to take on remission of diabetes, and that's probably where we're coming in here, with the ultimate recommendation that, um, a, 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 that a remission of diabetes can be achieved through substantial weight loss, and we'll, we'll come back to that, um, and that a, a formula diet approach is appropriate for doing that, provided you have, um, you've attended to the medications, and that's important because if people start losing weight rapidly, blood glucose falls rapidly, as rapidly as after bariatric surgery. The surgeons have told us, are there any surgeons here? Bariatric surgeon, no, good. I can be really, really bad. They claimed all sorts of metabolic effects in bariatric surgery, but they are actually nearly all the results of just not eating for a few days after you've been in surgery. Um, so you have to attend to the medication. If you don't stop the antihypertensive medications, you will have postural hypotension, and we have wonderful stories of people collapsing, crashing cars, all that stuff, and hypoglycemia potentially if you remain on diabetes medication. Weight loss is very potent as a metabolic treatment. So there you go. Um, so we think it can be reversed into remission, and I'll show you some of the evidence. We have international criteria now for remission, which is blindingly simple, isn't it? It means you no longer qualify as diabetic by international criteria, hemoglobin A1C below 48, and you're no longer on medication, which would otherwise push down with, as treatment rather than being in remission, isn't it? Or is it? And we can discuss that or consider whether remission with treatment is the same as, or should be the same as remission without treatment, without drug treatment. Anyway, we've agreed on these criteria, and the, even the Americans finally agreed. Um, they love their drugs in America. Um, and they wanted to continue treatment with, uh, with medication. The importance of a remission of diabetes, if you speak to your patients, so I think one of the good, big, big messages that we've learned in, in my career is that we need to speak to our patients and listen to them and understand what they want rather than what we think they ought to want. Um, the sense of self empowerment If somebody has been diagnosed with diabetes, they will remember that day, the moment they were told, you have, I won't point, you have diabetes, is a kind of wow thing. And to be able to say, you no longer have diabetes, is very, very empowering. Um, they don't like taking medication. Many of them don't take it anyway. Uh, they don't like the stigma and notion that they have to behave differently. Um, there are costs attached to diabetes, including things like life insurance, mortgages, travel insurance, which if you go to the right company, at least, you don't have to pay after you have a remission. And hopefully avoiding the complications we came into this on the back, and this slide has been shown in this room on a number of occasions over the years. This is the study, we, in the days before we gave studies names, this is a study we did uh, in, in Aberdeen where John Stars invented the, the Diabetes Clinic for Scotland. It was the very first, but he called it the Diabetes and Dietetic Clinic in Aberdeen. Vision, the man had vision. And he himself had type one diabetes. And what we showed in this study was that if people did not lose weight in the first year after diagnosis. They lost about seven years of life, about the same as happens nowadays. But if they lost more weight with the help of the dietitians, and they were fierce dietitians, they lived longer. And I've just, we, we had data which took us up to 14 years, at which point life expectancy was the same as people who never had diabetes living in the northeast of Scotland. So 14, 15 kilograms looked like it kind of knocked out the entire disease process. Then along came, after a good many years, John Dixon in Melbourne, the Western Island over there, um, who took people with type 2 diabetes, and he randomized them to have bariatric surgery, a lap band, or to remain in the diabetes clinic, and asked, after two years, how many remain diabetic, how many don't. And after bariatric surgery, if they lost 10 kilograms, but actually it could have been 15, because there's nobody in that greenish gap in the middle there, 83%, 80, yes, 83% were no longer, were in remission, not requiring medication, free from diabetes um, after two years. And the question we had was, surely we could achieve this without surgery, 
because 10 or 15 kilograms weight loss is not impossible using modern approaches. So we developed a diet program over about 10 or 12 years called Counterweight Plus, which used a formula diet, and I'll show you it, to, for the weight, to induce the weight loss and then um, moving on to weight loss maintenance. And we designed a study which was submitted to funding, I think five times and rejected and rejected and rejected. People won't do it. It won't achieve remission. It, it won't last anyway. Um, you can't recruit enough people and so it went on. After five times, we finally got the funding to do exactly what was planned um, eight years earlier um, and to do this funding from Diabetes UK. And what we did was to do a study entirely in primary care, so patients didn't come to the hospital. The intervention was delivered entirely by a nurse or a dietitian if there was one, and there were more nurses in Scotland than in England. Uh, they didn't even have to see a doctor at any point. And we picked perfectly ordinary people with type 2 diabetes across the country, over-recruiting in areas of, of deprivation because that's where more diabetes is and where it's more difficult to manage. They had an average um, duration of diabetes of three years, and we put a limit of six years just to be, give us a high likelihood of getting remission because if you go beyond 10 years, remission is less likely. People tend to remain diabetic, whatever. Average age 54, hemoglobin A1C 55 millimoles per litre, BMI 35. So this is very typical of what we are dealing with in, in primary care across the country. And on day one, we asked them to stop their medication, their diabetes medication, the antihypertensive, and their diuretic medication, all of them, stop the whole bank shoot. Uh, the GPs were terrified of this um, because they thought these are vital and patients can't possibly live without them, ha ha. We gave them a much better treatment, and a much more potent treatment, which was day one, start on this diet program, formula diet, 850 calories a day, nutritionally balanced, um, and you'll do this for 12 weeks. Got a holiday coming up, a wedding, da, da, da. You can extend it up to 20 weeks just to keep you in the trial because life will get in the way with our patients, and they don't think it's a cancer, so you know, they're liable to stop the treatment. We gave them that flexibility. Introduce foods, meals, one by one, we thought a week for breakfast, a week for lunch, a week for evening, ha ha, no. This was much harder, and it took us two, three, four, even a month to get people happy to move on to one meal and then the next meal. They found this threatening, they had to make decisions, um, and, and that was their, their biggest challenge, was moving on to weight loss maintenance. Even though we had talked them through this from, from day one, what they would need to do. This is what it looked like, total diet replacement, very ordinary um, formula diet, nothing special about that. 850 calories a day. When we moved on to food introduction, we then gave them step counters. We purposely did not ask them to try and do two difficult things at the same time at the beginning, um, partly because we know people find it difficult to do th two things at once. The other, um, the, our colleagues in Jutteborough about 100 years ago showed that people with type 2 diabetes have um, a, a lack of type 1 muscle fibers. They have an excess of type 2 muscle fibers, which makes it really difficult to do endurance activities, to keep walking long distances, which is what you need to burn up um, carbohydrate or fat with exercise. So they find it difficult. They get tired and fatigue. So physical activity was something we, we tended to play down, but we did then ask them, increase if you possibly can now that you've lost weight. Um, and importantly, we offered a, a weight loss um, relapse management short, sharp return to the formula diet if people put on more than two kilograms in weight. That was the theory. In practice, uh, COVID came along and all sorts of things. They didn't all take that up as they probably should have done, but that was the intention, and, and those who did seem to benefit from it. So there you go. The whole program, and just reverting to this, the diet program we developed, it's called Counterweight, and it's still there. It's now a commercial company. It's actually doing very well. Um, was based not on randomized control trial, but on continuous improvement methodology, which is how you develop any service for a community. If you're a banker, insurance agency, a policing agency, you, you don't do randomized control trials, you take feedback. And that's why Toyota beat Morris, uh, uh, Morris, Morris Miners back in the 1960s or 70s. So, so that, was, that was the principle by which we developed the program and continually improved it, and that, that I'm pleased to say is continuing. The results of the study, I think you've all probably seen, but. We, we aim to get over 20% remissions at one year because the public health people said we'd have to change the management of diabetes in the country if we got that. Um, in fact, we got 46% with a mean weight loss of 10 kilograms. So not everybody followed that program right the way through, sadly. Uh, tried as hard as we could. At two years, 
the remission rate was still well above the one-year target at 36%, but that decline was because of 15 individuals. The total was about 300 recruited, 150, 149 in each group. 15 individuals, 10%, put weight back on to closer than 10 kilograms from their baseline, and they then relapsed. And we were able to show later that was when they reaccumulated the fat that was in ectopic sites in the liver and the pancreas. If they lost 15 kilograms, which is our notional target, we knew many of them wouldn't, but we'd aimed for that. If they lost 15 kilograms, on the right-hand side there, the remission rate at one year was 86%, at two years, 82%, exactly the same as with bariatric surgery at two years, provided they lost that amount of weight. And indeed, putting um, 10 and 15 together, about three quarters would remain free from diabetes for two years if they lost over 10 kilograms, which is it's sort of impressive. What happened to the blood pressure? All these panic-stricken GPs, here are the data. In fact, I had a, a message this morning about uh, anxiety about stopping the antihypertensive drugs from Singapore um, for another study. And this is what happened. In the white line are the people who were not on medication previously. And you can see that dropped by about 15 millimeters of mercury. That's a big drop in blood pressure. Uh, and this, is, this slide simply shows the weight loss induction phase up to usually 12 weeks, but in, in some, some individuals up to 20 weeks. Um, in the green, the people who'd been on one medication for their blood pressure, and it might have been, it was usually amlodipine or captopril, one or the other. Um, and you can see that that fell more steadily, but still at the end, about 10 millimeters of mercury down. Those in the yellow were those on two, three, or four medications for their blood pressure. There was no rebound rise because 850 calorie diet is a very potent treatment for hypertension. So we stopped the medication, didn't rise, and then as their weight came down, it too, they too came down. But in that yellow group, about a third of them did require to go back onto, med onto one medication uh, during that time. So not everybody can remain free from antihypertensive medication in the long term. Um, Roy Taylor, who I haven't mentioned, uh, was my comrade in arms, and thank you to Diabetes UK for putting us together. We were very old friends, and we did the study together in his smaller cohort in, in Newcastle, around Newcastle. We, we did the met, um, mechanistic studies here, and just to summarize these, people in the blue column are the people who achieve remissions, and this is data for two years, and it shows a dramatic fall in liver fat, a fall in the VLDL export, and a fall in fat in the pancreas. And these were associated strongly with, with remission from, from freedom from diabetes. The yellow um, line are those who had relapsed. So at two years, they went back up, and you can see that their liver fat went back to normal, back to fat, as it were, as did the pancreas, and the VLDL actually increased. And during that time, the um, pancreas resumed gradually normal physiology. And that astonishing series of photographs at the top there shows a pancreas on the right, which is a totally normal person, never been diabetic, and how over two years the pancreas from this really sick uh, organ that we thought had lost its capacity to make insulin gradually filled out, the volume increased. And at the bottom, the maximum insulin secretion with glucose and arginine gradually over two years returned to normal. Not returned a bit, but turned to normal over two years. Um, astonishing data, beautiful data. That's the extraordinary photographs from the magnetic resonance um, imaging of the pancreas. The first phase insulin response was returned not to normal of non-diabetic people, but it returned to the normal value of people who are going to get diabetes. And we know this because of offspring and pre-diabetes, there is a limited first phase. Uh, it's, it's limited below never diabetic people. And that returned more quickly over about... Uh, uh, six months to, to that level. So the first phase insulin response was restored. Economic analysis showed there was a small increase in life. We didn't expect people to live miles longer, a little bit longer. They felt better, and it all cost less. So this is good news. It cost less if you continued the program for about five years. That's when the health economics broke even. But we had some questions like, we assume that all those remissions would have relapsed after three years. And that's how we did the analysis for economics, to, to be very conservative. Did they all relapse at three years? And we also asked the question, can we sustain these remissions longer, and would there be clinical benefits? Now, the study was not designed to do that, but we did get funding to continue up to five years, and I can show you the results here. They're not yet published. And any, any of you have got um, a paper to review from The Lancet, please be kind. <laughs> I'm looking at one or two of you. Um, 
So at five years, we had 85 in what we call the extension group. These are people who've been through the intervention uh, for five years. Oh, five minutes. Uh, that's, that's just five minutes. No, five years. You got the card wrong. Uh, for, for 85 and 82 in the original control group. We still had data on, so roughly equal numbers. In that extension group, the weight loss of 6.1 kilograms was maintained at five years. And I can tell you that's much better than we usually get in clinical trials up to five years. In fact, there are very few, but that's fairly impressive. The original control group, after two years, we sent a letter to them all and say, here are the results. Weight loss really makes a difference. Please go out and do it. And we sent to their general practitioners guidance on how to help them with the cardiac weight plus diet. So a lot of them, after two years, then went down the road and did lose weight. And they had impressively lost 4.6 kilograms at the five-year point. Remember, these were people who had volunteered for the trial, allocated to the con um, control group, and then they themselves uh, made good later. Hemoglobin A1c was pretty much the same between the groups, but, and, and the same proportion with uh, hemoglobin A1c below 48 millimoles per mole, but with the difference that in the, this original intervention extension group, 40% still not on medication at five years, whereas only 13% in the control group had then come off medication at that point. Remissions of those with data, 13% in the extension group, 5% in the original controls. Now, you can argue whether you think that's good or bad. It's obviously not as high as it was at one year or at two years. It's declined. We knew that was going to happen. Um, but I'll show you why that's not the whole... Uh, they, they look at, uh, sort of unprecedented at that point, but I'll come back to that. Blood pressure, we think, was probably the same between the groups. They all, all of course, were managed according to guidelines, um, and that was the same blood pressure that, as a baseline in our extension group. We didn't collect data from the original controls. Um, but 47% of them were still off antihypertensive medications compared to only 35% in the controls. And we measured quality of life, which was, um, and I'll show you a slide of this, it was increased at one year, two year, at every year for five years. And there are not many dietary studies that do that. Uh, insulin, gamma GT, triglycerides all improved at the beginning and that improvement remained. Now, the intention, intervention group, um, as they gradually went out of remission, did spend longer time with their weight 10 kilograms below the baseline, 27% versus 8%. Hemoglobin A1C in the sub-diabetic range, 29 versus 15%. Off all medications, 50% compared to 16. And then in remission was 27% of five years compared to 4% in the, in the um, original control group. And we saw half the number of serious adverse events, that's hospitalizations, in the intervention group compared to the control. So the control group had twice as many serious adverse events and hospitalizations. So it's kind of going in the right direction. We were able to look at what we've called um, we, uh, MACE events, cardiovascular events, were no different between the groups. But we've invented a thing called MADE events, which are um, moderate and um, major diabetes-related adverse events. And those who had an event in the next year, uh, sorry, those who were protected from having an event in the next year were those who kept their weight five kilograms below baseline. I think we probably knew that anyway from previous research. But then we looked at associations over the five years uh, to look at freedom from diabetes-related events, and we found that was predicted by a lower BMI at five years, lower hemoglobin on C at years two, three, and four, and by the duration in remission. So the longer people had in remission, the more likely they were to be free from diabetes-related events. And this is, these are the sorts of events they were. A lot of these were infections, bacterial infections of one kind or another, um, and remarkable freedom from cancers, as it appeared. Now, this is very small numbers, and I wouldn't pin my career on this, but there were no new cancers in the intervention group, but seven in the uh, extension group. Jim was talking about doing a sign test yesterday. I haven't dared do it because I know Sheila's in the audience. Okay, there you go. Quality of life, what was that one? Oh, I don't even do that one. Uh, quality of life, health, I've jumped two slides. Well, that's not a, oh golly, what's happening now? I was trying to go backwards, but it doesn't allow me to go backwards. Is it that way? <laughs> oh, well, hang on. You're trying to trick, trick me now. There you are, quality of, that's the quality of life. A big improvement, which carried on for uh, each year for five years. We did, I think it's important here, just to break off, one of my colleagues, um, George Tom, is a dietitian now, Dr. George Tom, wrote a very nice paper, which he looked at um, the whole principles behind this. And his conclusion was differences between diets are marginal. What matters much more is gaining the, um, the, you know, the confidence of, you, of your patient with their, um, their practitioner to be able to adhere to whatever diet you're giving them. 
And that's, that's the important thing. And also to recognize that achieving behavioral change is much more likely to be to do with uh, m working with the mood and the, the preferences of the individual, not so much with the medical outcomes. Um, a reminder that a lot of the, our patients were being given drugs that cause weight gain, and, and as doctors, we, we are prone to do that. I'm going to jump the next couple of slides because they're all kind of well published, except to show that in addition to the uh, randomized trials using formula diets that we included in our, in our um, 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 paper in the, for the Diabetes and Nutrition Study Group, we now have data from a similar study, same intervention in South Asian people with 40% emissions. The retune study in people with a BMI down to 23 from Roy Taylor with, gave 70% remissions. So making the point you don't have to have a BMI over 30 or even over 25. If you have that and type di diabetes, you have fatty liver, you have fatty pancreas, losing that extra fat will get you clear of the disease. There are data coming from Australia and a small study in Kathmandu that we might discuss later. Um, can't go away without mentioning GLP-1 agonists because everybody wants to know about, is this the answer? And we're getting people from all over the world now saying, right, we'll now slap patients onto GLP-1 agonists and we can forget about diet, can't we? And the advertising is wicked um, because here are the titles of several of the papers. Ta-da! Semaglutide. Semaglutide and liraglutide. Which one's that? Liraglutide and terzapatide. These are drugs which are getting 20, 25% weight loss. And each of these papers, the title says a drug effect. In each of these abstracts, there is no mention of diet at all. In each of these studies, diet was a very important part of the study. They were all done with very good quality dietary advice. And it's the combination which actually is beneficial. So I think we've answered most of these questions for you. I'm reminded that Jim and I and others, and what happened to Rachel Elliott? She's not here, is she? Um, wonderful people who have put together the first notional center in, in, in translational research here in, in uh, University of Otago and a paper in the BMJ. This idea of bringing people together from biomedical sciences and epidemiologists and you find that the, the lab people really want to know about the epidemiology and the epidemiologists really want to know about the lab stuff. This has been fascinating stuff. Boyd is sitting here. I didn't know Boyd was going to be sitting here. You remember these pictures, Boyd. No country has ever turned around type 2 diabetes yet. Despite all our educational efforts, education actually doesn't work. Commercial marketing works very well. And it's sold us a lot of motor cars and a lot of foods which we wouldn't have recognized 50 years ago. We have traditional diets, and here's one in Scotland, which we can discuss over lunch or something. The no doubt, that was my lunch on Wednesday of last week. And there is a similar diet which we're using for our intervention in Nepal. Traditional foods, 850 calories a day. Do that for 12 weeks, you'll lose your diabetes. Then you modify one of those meals into something more interesting and exciting for, for maintenance. And those approaches really do work. Um, da, 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 da. I'm being waved. Right. What do we do about the public health things? Well, here's a story which we can discuss. And I think, I think there's something to said for this. A paper we wrote several years ago now, three years ago perhaps, um, which relied on this woman. Was she a girl? What is she? Who is she? And she became that. And now she's that. And she's terrifying. This girl, she's terrifying. Why? Because she has marshaled millions of young people to make a noise about climate change and our environment. Greta Thunberg. Did she do it alone? Oh, no. She's got a massive machinery behind her. There is a science attached to this. And here is a, a potted version of the science behind uh, establishing and maintaining a social movement. Social movements across the world are driven largely by young people. And I, I was discussing Martin Luther King. Did Martin Luther King turn around civil rights in North America? No, he sent out children in front to march and to suffer. It was an extraordinary time. Children, young people, have the capacity to build social change. And if we want to actually take on the food industry and say, we don't want the future of diabetes and metabolic syndrome that, the that, that we're currently facing and that our parents have got, we're going to have to demand changes. And we need Greta Thunberg out there. Um, and there's a quote, finally, from one James Barry, OM. Youth have for far too long left exclusively in our hands the decisions that in national matters that are more vital, I think international as well, to them than to us. And that was in his, also in 1922, just as insulin was being invented across the world, James Barry, who um, wrote Peter Pan, 
uh, said these words, and I think I, I would echo them today. I think we, if we really want to turn around this disease at the public health level, it's young people we have to turn to. Jim, I've overstepped my mark, and I've had the sign yeah. thrown at me three times, so yeah. apologies for that. Yeah.